Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this video, we are going to be talking about child abuse. Now, before we get started, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel if you guys are new. So let's talk about child abuse. Child abuse is a type of mistreatment or neglect of a child, and it's usually done by the parent or other caregiver. So pretty much someone who is close to the child, who always has a lot of access to the child, is gonna be uh, one of the perpetrators of this type of abuse. So keep that in the back of your mind. Now there are three types of child abuse. You have physical abuse, you have emotional or psychological abuse, and you have sexual abuse. Now one thing to always, always remember, and this is a very important thing, is that as a medical student, as a physician, suspected child abuse must be reported, it must be reported to local child protective services. As a medical student and as a physician, you are obligated by law to report suspected child abuse to CPS. So do not ever forget that. Now, let's talk about physical abuse specifically. In physical abuse, a child is gonna have injuries uh, caused by a parent or caregiver. Now, this is the most important part about physical abuse is that the injury is gonna be caused by someone really close to the, the child. It's usually caused by the closest family member and often that means it's gonna be the mother. So keep in mind, this person is always taking of caring of the child and they may be overworked, they may have, you know, they may be uh, uh, exhausted and fatigued and therefore their judgment may be a little bit cloudy and that might cause them to cause a little bit of harm to the child. Um, now, this commonly affects kids that are under one year. And that's really important to understand because that's one of the very important parts of physical abuse in child abuse. Uh, like I said earlier, it's usually caused by someone really close who is often exhausted of taking care of the child. And this is also identified a lot of times by healthcare practitioners. They're the main people who are noticing this because they're taking care of the child. So as far as statistics are concerned, one thing you should be aware of is that 40% of deaths related to child abuse and neglect usually occur in children who are less than one year old. So that's a very high number of deaths uh, uh, related to child abuse. Now, when it comes to assessing child abuse, especially physical abuse, history is key. History is amazingly important. It is so, so important. Now, a child uh, or a parent may come in with a child for a minor trauma. They might present to you with a chief complaint of, you know, the kid's been crying a lot. Now, when you do a physical exam, you're gonna see major, major injuries. And when it comes to taking history, one thing you will notice is that caregiver history changes over time. This is very important because they're not able to keep their lies in check, in order, and when you keep asking them the same questions over and over again, they're gonna skew the answers that they're giving you, okay? Now, when it comes to physical manifestation of child abuse, we have um, uh, several findings that are very important that you will see a lot of times. And the most important of these findings is gonna be bruising. Bruising is going to be um, located in you know multiple places, usually the buttocks, the trunk, or the ear and neck. And this multiple bruising pattern will you know should tip you off to some sort of physical child abuse. You can also see fractures, and this is you know a little bit harder to detect. But the way it's going to happen is you're going to see multiple fractures in different stages of healing when you do a full body scan. Uh, of the child to see what's happening in the bones and often these fractures are going to be located in the ribs and long bones of, uh, of a baby because that's where the child is often being hit uh, in those scenarios to be punished. And then finally, you will also see evidence of head trauma. And this is also known as shaken baby syndrome. You guys may have heard of it, but this is caused when uh, a parent or a caregiver kind of shakes the baby to make them stop crying in a very, very aggressive way. And that causes the brain to uh, hit the hit the skull over and over again and that can cause neurological problems but one of the hallmarks of shaken baby syndrome and head trauma is retinal hemorrhages and we have a photo of retinal hemorrhages right here so you can see these little hemorrhages normally this shouldn't be happening but you can see them here you have the optic disc you have the macula right here and then there are these little tiny spots everywhere which show you that there are retinal hemorrhages happening and you can also have a subdural hematoma. And that's when, you know, where I was talking about when the brain hits the inside of the skull. Well, that can cause a subdural hematoma. So keep that in mind. So as far as risk factors are concerned, the risk factors for this type of physical abuse is associated with the parents 
and the child. So there are two types of risk factors. Now the parental risk factors consist of the parent being a single or a very young parent, so a parent who has a substance abuse history or who have a psychiatric illness, and they can also be parents with low levels of education. All of these risk factors, you know, play a big role in causing a parental uh, parental caused child abuse, physical abuse specifically. Now, as far as the child risk factors are concerned, if you have an unplanned or unwanted pregnancy, that can raise the risk of physical abuse, behavioral issues. So if you have a child that is very difficult to work with, that can cause physical abuse, and then also learning disabilities. Uh, children who have learning disabilities often have behavioral issues, and they're often very difficult to work with because they don't pick up these cues that normal kids would. So therefore, you're going to see a higher risk of physical abuse in these uh, situations as well. Let's move on to child abuse, but specifically sexual abuse. Now, sexual abuse happens uh, usually to a child by a known male perpetrator. So there, it's usually a male, and it's someone that's really close to the child. It could be an immediate family member, it could also be an extended family member, a neighbor, or um, a friend of the family as well. So just keep that in mind. Now, whereas in physical abuse, it commonly affects children less than one years old, sexual abuse is going to affect kids in the 9 to 12 year range. So the prepubertal children are usually at a higher risk of being assaulted sexually and having to go through sexual abuse. Now, the classic presentation for this case is going to be a patient uh, presenting for a regular visit, but when you do a, a complete history and analysis, again, the story is not going to add up to the physical exam findings. You may see trauma to the mouth, to the anus, to the general genitals. This is a huge red flag, as well as STIs, because these things should not happen in kids normally, okay? So this is a very red flag. Now, if you see these things, you have to report it directly to CPS. Now, as far as psychological abuse is concerned, a lot of parents sometimes might accidentally cause psychological abuse, but this type of child abuse is a pattern of abuse that we're talking about. In this case, the parent is constantly telling the child that he is worthless, that he or she is useless, and this can be caused by verbal abuse, this can be caused by humiliation, so public humiliation can cause some psychological abuse, criticism, so if you're constantly nitpicking at your child everything that they're doing, criticizing their weight, their looks, their attitude, this can cause psychological abuse as well as intimidation. So if a parent is scaring their child, that can definitely have some jarring effects on the child's uh, psyche. Now, Another um, method of psychological abuse that can occur but is often overlooked is confinement. So a lot of times kids will be sent into the, you know, the corner as a punishment, but sometimes you'll see that kids have been confined to a certain area for prolonged periods of time. And this is a very, very, very concerning um, uh, punishment because it can cause, again, jarring psychological abuse problems. Now let's talk about child neglect. Child neglect occurs when a parent or a caregiver uh, fails to provide the child with adequate food, shelter, supervision, or education, or affection. Remember, we talked about attachment being a very important part of, uh, of child growth. Well, affection is also a very important part of a child feeling comfortable. And if they don't have these components, right, if they don't have adequate food or shelter, someone looking after them, someone taking care of them, and someone loving them, that's considered child neglect. And this is the most common form of child maltreatment. Abuse occurs a lot, but neglect is probably the most common because a lot of times it's overlooked and people don't realize they're doing it to their own child. The evidence of child neglect is going to be a child with poor hygiene, malnutrition, so they may be really small, really scrawny and skinny. They may have withdrawal symptoms because someone may not be taking care of them, someone may not be showing them attention, giving them that attachment. They may have impaired social and uh, emotional development, so they may not be able to communicate with people. And finally, they can also have failure to thrive. Now, one thing that I want to stress again is child abuse and child neglect must be reported to CPS.
All right, so let's end this video with the vulnerable child syndrome. Now in this syndrome, a parent may perceive their child to be at a higher risk for behavioral, developmental, or medical problems. And these, a perception can be real, the illness can be real, or it can be perceived. They could you know, be making it up in their mind. They just have a heightened sense of fear for their child. And this can be due to things like um, a very serious illness that happened to the child recently, or a life-threatening event. That can cause the parents to become very protective, very cautious about their child's care and their health, and become overly cautious in this case and pretty much uh, create a, a syndrome for the child to feel inadequate. One thing to understand is that this can result in missed school and the overuse of uh, medical services. Patients with vulnerable child syndrome will often present to the ER multiple times, they'll have multiple doctor visits and they'll show you the, the child for the most minor things uh, that you couldn't even think about, right? So. The risk factors for this, again, is going to be different con difficult conception, pregnancy, as well as prenatal anxiety and depression. And finally, we, you know, I don't want to knock off the fact that a serious illness or a life-threatening event can also be a risk factor for developing vulnerable child syndrome. Now, with that being said, thank you so much for watching, everybody. I really appreciate it. If you guys like this video, don't forget to like comment and subscribe to the channel and when you guys hit that subscribe button don't forget to hit the bell button right next to us so you can get notified every time we post and with that being said thank you so much for watching and i will see you guys here real soon